We're going to call this study session uh, to order. And I just wanted to, yeah, I want to wait. Miss Brooke, let me know when you're ready. Or should I say Miss Smith? <laughs> And we're live. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. This is um, I wanted to welcome you to the City Hall here at 6801 Delmar Boulevard. This is a study session and on Monday, January 9th, 2023. And we're going to start this meeting. Um, I'm going to wait for approval of the agenda. If there are any changes, I'm going to wait till the regular meeting unless somebody has anything they want to add to this study session. And if not, then we will move forward and open this up and I'll turn it over to Mr. Rose. Honorable Mayor Pro Tem Smotherson and Council Members, tonight I ask that you receive a presentation from the Commission on Stormwater Issues regarding the historic flooding that occurred on July the 26th of 2002 and again on July the 28th of 2002. To uh, the stormwater will be uh, presenting information on their review uh, of that historic flooding event. So I will turn things over to the commission. Yes, I'm Professor. Uh, uh, Emeritus of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Wash U, and I'm also a, a privilege to be a member of the uh, Stormwater Commission. Our commission, as you know, is an outgrowth of the task force established by the late uh, council member Paulette Carr, and now ably assisted by uh, our city liaison, uh, Tim Kusick, and uh, John Mulligan, city attorney, also is uh, very much in involved with our, our proceedings. Um, our commission is uh, constituted entirely of scientists and engineers. It's a professional group. I myself have published over 40 scientific uh, papers on Missouri hydrogeology and uh, flooding of the region uh, over uh, nearly 30 years. And so uh, 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 that's actually a, a longer and, and more comprehensive re record than anyone else living or dead. So I do have a lot to say, and I am going to fly tonight uh, through my presentation. Um, I want to uh, discuss our uh, what flash floods are by putting them in the context of, of what regional floods are like. Then I want to go on to uh, uh, are floods getting worse, and if so, why? And we're going to explore several of the uh, pe peculiar uh, geographic attributes of University City. I'll move on to discuss the uh, a synopsis of the 2022 flash flood that was so devastating, our record flood. And finally, I'll close with recommendations and then uh, pass the uh, baton to uh, uh, my fellow commissioner, uh, Mark Holly, who will discuss our new inundation map. So let's get on. Let's talk about flash flood character. And again, I want to put flash floods in the context of regional floods. If you look at these, this pair of illustrations from NASA, the top uh, shows the confluence of the Missouri and the Mississippi and the Illinois rivers under normal conditions. Uh, St. Louis County, of course, is in the lower center. The bottom shows the aftermath of the record 1993 flood. The, the water covered bluff to bluff. The, 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 zone of inundation was thousands of square miles and places five miles wide. It was truly devastating. There were 19 fatalities and so forth. Now, the next illustration shows you a hydrograph, a stage hydrograph. It's a, just a graph on the vertical axis of the water level and the horizontal axis is time, the date. And every dot is a single day but there's a lot of data between those dots. So this shows the progress of the 1993 flood. The flood at lasted for months. We were above flood stage over 100 days in 1993. The water rose some uh, 19 feet in, in 27 days in the most uh, severe part of the rise. 
and the uh, uh, flow of the, the Mississippi River here at St. Louis, this is the St. Louis gauge, went up a factor of nearly two and a half during that interval. So this is how a big river floods normally. And you know what? A box turtle could outrun this dang thing. It's only going up a foot a day or even less. The iconic videos you've seen of this beautiful farmhouse swirling around helplessly in the male storm of the 1993 flood is a levee break. It is not normal flooding. This is the progress of normal flooding. These things are boring, and they, yet they seem to get uh, most of our, hold most of our attention and get most of the press. Now let's look at a smaller flood, another record flood in St. Louis County. This is the uh, a flood of, of late uh, 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 December 2015 and early 2016. And I'm showing a pair of photos, uh, uh, one's a, just a Google Earth shot from satellites of uh, Valley Park. And the one below is an AP shot showing the inundation uh, near the Merrimack River. Uh, during this interval of time. Let's look at this record flood, and how it badly impacted us. Well, here again, we have a hydrograph stage versus time for this particular event. Again, I put dots on the, the hydrograph to, to count off the days. We were above flood stage for uh, eight days during this event. Uh, the water level increased 26 feet, but it took four days to do it. And again, we had an interstate flooded and a lot of damage and so forth, uh, mostly because we built in the floodplain. But again, this is the rise. The, the flow went up, I think, a factor of five during this uh, sharp interval of sharp increase in the water level. Now let's look at a, a third re record flood, which is of Deer Creek, our little creek just south of us. Uh, not, not the river to Pear, but it's the next basin to the south. We had a record flood in 2008 that remains a record flood throughout most of the basin. Now, the top shot I took to reproduce the bottom, the photographer's location in the bottom, the top shot's looking southward along Knight Avenue, uh, just uh, south of, of Interstate 64. And the bottom shot shows what this uh, region looked like in, in the morning of September 14th, 2008. Now note that the creek bottom is 17 feet below the bridge deck at this location. So what happened? What do these hydrographs look like? Well, here's the first couple of weeks of September in 2008, and you can see multiple flood pulses. Every time it rains sharply, the creek rises sharply, then it goes back. The major pulse, the third one on the right, that shows the 2008 record event, the water level increased 20 feet in seven hours. The flow went from five cubic feet per second to over 10,000. It went up a factor of 2,000 in seven hours. And by the end of the day, it was gone. It's incredible how sudden these things are how quickly they hit us. The stage rises are almost as great as they are for great rivers, but this, these things can happen overnight. And the consequences are severe. This, this particular flood killed two people in U City. The 1993 flood lasted months and covered thousands of square miles and who knows how many dozens of states and it only killed 19. The damages per square mile the fatalities per square mile for flash floods are vastly more severe than they are for regional floods, and they are of particular significance for University City. Now, so flash floods in small basins, they develop very suddenly with very little warning. They occur frequently and close to people. Not This isn't the mosquito flats down by the river. This is right in the heart of our neighborhoods. They cause large damages and fatalities, most of which are vehicle related. They feature large sudden stage increases that are comparable, a little less, but comparable to those of large and large rivers. Uh, the peak flows, however, unlike large rivers, are thousands of times normal flows. That flow of 10,000 CFS I showed you at Deer Creek, that's three times the flow of the Merrimack River. That's bigger than the average flow of the Kansas River. 
It's the seventh as large as the Missouri River, roaring right through our neighborhood in the morning. And then it's gone. And finally, our estimates of how frequently these things occur and how bad they are, are horrifically off. I've been discussing this, attempting to, for many, many years. Um, so are floods getting worse, and if so, why? Our records of uh, uh, inundation on our small creeks are not uh, long enough to really get a good statistical uh, grip on if floods are getting worse. We only have uh, 25 or so years of record. Uh, uh, and it looks like they're getting worse. After all, in U City, we've had pretty bad flooding in three of the last four years. Uh, uh, so they probably a case can be made. If you do the statistics in a robust way, it was just fine. There's a weak trends, but they're not as, as statistically robust as you might wish to believe. On the Mississippi River, we have records back to the beginning of the Civil War every day. And that's what I'm plotting up here. It's just And I've plot, made a plot out of a huge spreadsheet, daily records back to 1861 of feet above flood stage, right at, down at LaPlage Station, right at the arch versus time. Now, most people look at this graph and they see a trend. Uh, most people, except perhaps the Army Corps of Engineers, doesn't seem nothing here, but uh, most people see a significant trend that since World War II or so, we commonly see water levels that were unheard of a, a, a hundred years ago. And they happen quite frequently. Many times in the last 10 years, we've had horrific water levels, as you can see on the graph. So floods are certainly getting worse. And many people want to attribute this primarily to climate change. I think that is a factor, particularly on our smaller creeks. But the main factor here is river constriction. The Mississippi River is half as wide as it was historically. All the islands and sandbars and things that Mark Twain discussed are gone. This reduction in width by a factor of two is true all up the Missouri River, clear across the state, all the way to Sioux City, Iowa. So for a thousand miles, we have squeezed the rivers. And just like building plaque in your arteries, your blood pressure is going to go up and you're going to have a heart attack. This is flow restriction. Narrowing the rivers makes the floods higher. It's simple as that. And I number among several academics have been trying to explain this and change our regional outlook on how uh, rivers are managed for many, many years. Now then, how about you, city? We also have flow impedance. We have an incredibly restricted and channelized uh, river to pair. Over half of its length is cement line, cement floor, concrete walls or stone walls are in the lower left. The upper river to pair runs into a tunnel, which we just saw was horrifically undersized because it was all overtopped in the last flood. We have many undersized bridges that I pointed out years ago, and a lot of those get further clogged with debris during flooding, so the water's got to go over the top. In the, the lower right, I'm showing the Hanley Road Bridge and all this debris clogging up the bridge. You can see the, the leaf line on the fence. It's nearly four or five feet high. The water went right over the top. Every bridge except all of it was overtopped in this flood. The Olive Road Bridge uh, was almost overtopped uh, during the last flood. So let's look at University City. Uh, we're currently located right in the, around the bottom of the slide, bottom center right, right at the bottom. Uh, but you see the river to pair running along the center of the diagram. You see how it's uh, like a cookie cutter, rectilinear segments, how it's been straightened and channelized. You can also see the huge amount of impervious surface we have, which is another one of our problems. The USGS study, argues uh, or calculated that this river to pair basin is 43 and a half percent impervious cover. That is higher than almost any place in Missouri. This is the highest on its table. And so this is ground zero for accelerating runoff to our river. 
let's compare this slide to a 1909 plat map of what the River de Pere was like before we fixed it. Look at all the meanders in the River de Pere and the huge farms. We've built where we shouldn't. We've built in the geomorphic floodplain. We straighten the river. We've channelized the river. We've run it into a tunnel, all thinking that's going to fix it. Well, as a natural scientist, I think uh, some of those approaches are not, not the most cost-effective things you could do and look at your historical record and draw your own opinion about that. I made, uh, after the last flood, uh, through the Stormwater Commission and, and my other uh, academic associates, and, and I enlisted the, the substantial help of my fellow council uh, commissioner, uh, Eric Stein, and uh, we rented equipment and we got stuff going and, and made an inundation map of the 2022 event. Uh, I personally put in over 200 hours of surveying to gather the data to, to make this map. We put in 70 flood uh, marks and so forth, uh, plus in-stream sensors. But you see the, the width of the inundation zone and all along Wilson Avenue and stuff, uh, uh, where the homes are in the floodplain where they don't belong. Yes, indeed, they do get inundated. And uh, the other thing, the, Real eye opener on this particular slide is the River de Pere tunnel was over top for the first time since its construction in uh, 1940. That resulted in the uh, uh, disruption of the Metrolink system. It resulted in a fatality uh, near uh, Skinker Boulevard. It resulted in huge damages. Firehouse number one on Vernon Avenue had a foot and a half of water in it. Uh, a lot of homes were were flooded uh, far east of the tunnel mouth. Uh, so uh, that's because the tunnel was undersized or clogged. Now then, the River de Pere is the most flash flood prone stream in the state of Missouri. This last year, I published yet another paper that uh, uh, made a uh, mathematical analysis of every one of the nearly 300 gauging stations in the state of Missouri. And guess who's number one for the flashiest stream for its size? We're it. And I point that out not as a local embarrassment, but maybe as a sound bite that, that can be used in, in future applications, but also should help guide your own thinking about what we're dealing with. There are natural factors as to why this is. We do have a small watershed, and small, small watersheds are more flashy than big ones. We do have a west to east uh, uh, geographic uh, morphology of the basin, so it's kind of along storm tracks and so forth. Uh, there are human factors, though, that uh, outweigh the uh, natural factors. We have a really high impervious surface coverage, something should be, we, we need to do more thinking about that. We've channelized and straightened their stream lost our natural storage capability. Storm sewers convey water to the channel very rapidly. Uh, we've destroyed our riparian borders. We have undersized and clogged bridges in a poorly maintained channel. We've constricted our floodplain. So, and we built where we should not, which amplifies damages and, and amplifies flood levels. Climate change is also a factor. We may have be having more intense storms more frequently. Uh, I think that's certainly a factor. But the human factors that are within our control are far more important than just blaming climate change on, on our woes. Uh, so there's plenty, uh, plenty we can do. Um, your fellow commissioners, we're ready for this one. I've I spent my life uh, measuring and studying natural systems with real measures. And uh, uh, Commissioner Stein and I, with, with uh, funding from U City, established three rain gauges that are part of our early warning system. I'll talk a little more about in a moment. Uh, we also, just in March, the early warning system was put in, by the way, and fully operational by October 2021. Uh, and working just fine. It's all calibrated and stuff. Uh, everything's 
uh, really good. Uh, we also in 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 March, and this was funded by the city. I recommended we put in a network of in-stream sensors, and holy cow, we put in nearly nine sensors clear along the river to Perry Channel, and happened to catch the biggest flood in history with all these sensors all the way from from Dealman Road to, to uh, Pennsylvania Avenue. And I think we ought to even get more. And finally, when studying the 2008 flood, a uh, colleague David Nelson and I in California, he's a fellow geophysicist, his grad student buddy years ago, uh, we developed protocols and an inundation map for the 2008 flood, but we knew what we needed to do. So uh, surveying flood marks, you can see in the central shot, there's Eric Stein, you see the leaf line on the fence? We surveyed these things in, have precise uh, elevations within a few inches using a combination of a GNSS uh, rental equipment, which talks to the satellites and, and MoDOT uh, ground-based elevation stations and traditional surveying. I, I through WashU, since I'm still a emeritus professor, I, I have pretty much permanent lo loan of a total station uh, that, that they've loaned us. So with these combination of things, we actually have in this last event, the best documented flash flood in history, I think. We had more sensors, more diverse kinds in the ground and with follow-up work than we have, you have at your fingertips, probably the best study ever made of a, a flash flood. You can't plan for these things. It's hard, we react, but uh, we had all this stuff in place and, and the capabilities of doing the, the necessary follow-up work. Now then, um, what happened during July 2022? This is a shot given me by uh, Amy Dork. Uh, Amy is a uh, resident just a quarter mile to the north of us uh, along uh, uh, Trinity Avenue, just a quarter mile to the north. So you go to bed, this is your neighborhood, 5 a.m. the next morning, there you are. These are beautiful homes, all very close to Dartmouth Avenue. I mean, the whole neighborhood was was submerged. Um, Eric Clark, a fellow commissioner, uh, uh, took several really valuable photographs of, of very close to peak water of the uh, 2022 flood. This one's near near the Olive Avenue Bridge, uh, looking west. So it's right along Olive Boulevard. Uh, near the river to pair. Um, so what happened? This particular slide shows a uh, uh, NOAA map. It shows the six hour rainfall delivery color coded. And that uh, bright purple swath, you see the little X at the end of the purple? That's us, that's U City. There were training thunderstorms that just kept following the same storm track. And neither one of them was particularly horrific, but they just followed just like a train, one after another, and they just kept hitting us. So we ended up with uh, uh, nearly 10 inches of rain in, uh, throughout the day. Uh, and you said he was right in the crosshairs of this particular uh, storm event. And the consequences, of course, were severe. Now, you've heard the, the weather guys tell you all about how this is a uh, thousand year flood. That is true. It is a thousand year, not a thousand year storm. If you look, this particular uh, slide is a uh, uh, NOAA graph showing rainfall intensities uh, for different recurrence intervals. This is on the uh, left vertical line, shows you the return things. And so you see for a 10 year flood, for example, every uh, 10 minutes we get what, let's say 0.98 inches of rain. So for any time interval and return period, this tells you how much rain to expect. And the red bars show what happened in New City according to our, our uh, 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 early warning network, uh, 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 rain gauges as to what kind of rainfall delivery we had. And you can see for six hour and 12 hour rainfall events, uh, this was indeed like a thousand year flood or a thousand year storm. The flood 
was more like a 50 year storm because 12 hours of rainfall are not what drives these flash floods. One or two hours of rainfall is what drives our flash floods. And so the return intervals that are appropriate for our particular stream are in the blue box. So don't believe this thousand year stuff. We commonly use exaggerated return intervals to uh, 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 de-emphasize the frequency of, of occurrence of these things. But th this is not something you gotta wait to, for the second coming for it to, to happen again. Now then, here's our, some of our in-stream sensors. This is just four of the nine, but I'm showing the progress of the flood from Kempland Avenue to uh, uh, Olive Boulevard and Green to uh, uh, Chamberlain Avenue and Orange and then down to the Vernon Avenue Bridge in red along the top axis on the inverted scale. I'm showing the rainfall delivery. So here's the thing. This is again just hydrographs, but there's four different stations for four of our in-stream sensors from upstream to downstream. You can see the flood came like a monster. This peak water progressed downstream, but very quickly. Look at the sharpness of that rise. It didn't start raining hard until one o'clock. Look what happened by two o'clock. We only had two inches of rain by then. Yet most of the rise of the river happened before 2 a.m. And then with the continued rainfall, yeah, it added insult to injury. But uh, you could see the sharpness of the rise. Starts raining at one, rains hard, two o'clock, wow, kabam. All the, the, our in-stream sensors are telling us the same thing. So don't believe this uh, nine inches of rain stuff. The, the rain that got us is the first little blip on the, the black line on the far left of that diagram. Just a few inches of that nine inches are what caused the, the majority of our flooding problems for this event. Now, uh, this is a, a FEMA's diagram. It's a cross section now of, of height versus distance upstream. Uh, for the river to pair, the bottom line is the creek bottom, and the other profiles kind of parallel to the creek bottom uh, show the supposed water elevations for a 10, 50, 100, and 500 year flood. Uh, the tunnel mouth is clear at the uh, left end of the, the uh, scale. So this is what FEMA thinks had happened. This is what happened. The red line is from our survey work and our in-stream sensors. And you can see uh, further upstream, like at Groby Bridge, this is more like a 10 or 20 year flood, according to FEMA. You move downstream, becomes more like a 50 year flood. Further downstream, 100 year flood. Near the tunnel mouth, it's more in a 500 year flood. So first of all, models do not do a great job, reality is a far more informative than models. And the reason we had such bad inundation uh, near the tunnel mouth and along Vernon and, and Dartmouth Avenue is because indeed it was a horrific event there, but it's because of the inadequacy of our structures or their clogging or the system being overcharged or something that, that does require further study. So summary, the 26th flood, it uh, intense summer thunderstorm, most of the flooding occurs in the summer. It uh, developed the whole development times, a few hours and the whole thing's over by late morning. It, uh, it was a thousand year storm, but it, on average about a 50 year flood, the severity increasing downstream. You said he damages, I don't know, they're tens of millions of dollars. I don't have precise figures. We know there's a fatality. I know from the fire uh, uh, men in our city who served very honorably that there were more than 50 rescues. We have hundreds of condemned homes. I have saw hundreds of lost vehicles. Uh, we disrupted Metro Lane and so forth. And the worst place, the worst damages are along the floodplain where we built where we should not. 
It's particularly in channelized reaches near tributary confluences, uh, undersized and clogged bridges, and near the tunnel mouth. Now, finally, let's have some recommendations. Um, all of these recommendations will cost nothing. Many of them have been made years ago. Some of them by me five years ago. They will cost nothing. Let's have, let's have, uh, I can't. We need high water signs. Many municipalities have signs informing people that oh, here's a 1993 flood or whatever. It's interesting and it's important. And it keeps people thinking about this problem. We need connection of our early warning system to the code red system. That's urgent you need it. It is far overdue. Uh, that needs done long before this coming flood season. You said he knows nothing about the 1957 that would help put this stuff in context so you can make it better. So you have to work closely with the commission. You have access. You need to routine update the database, gain information, your integrity, the standardized protocol, collecting information, sending you to the strength of the codes for impervious systems and impervious surfaces. I myself am a victim. It's cost me over ten thousand dollars because my neighbor paved over his backyard. That's okay with you, Sid. Drop all kinds of water on. It. Just try to deal with that with the law. When you said he has no ordinances about uh, impervious cover or small yards, sanction water disclosure for flood history. And home purchase. Same as recommended. Possibly as part of the occupancy permit, uh, uh, some disclosures could be made. Now, we do have a few budget items. I personally recommend more monitoring, okay. not that expensive. And we should have uh, for situational awareness uh, in to augment our early warning system, just predictions. But uh, a few real time uh, in stream sensors, not the ones you download later, uh, could provide uh, information to our first responders to how quickly the river's rising. So, on top of all, uh, we need the first four elevations of everybody, some 600 homes in the floodplain, uh, surveyed. And I could do it. I'm not going to do it as near, nearly as good as a professional who could do it. And, you know, I'm an old guy. Christ, well, let me, let me sleep, you know. It probably cost 35 grand or something. I recommend that done for many reasons that other council uh, commissioners speak to. But we need it. We need realistic information to make uh, realistic plans. Data driven flood management decisions. That is what is needed here. And um, we need better databases on the properties. We need following floods, better protocols, collecting information. We do have a remarkably accurate inundation map. I think the most accurate ever made uh, for this recent flood. By the way, you can't take a satellite picture or anything else. Events, probably in the middle, middle of the night, line. you don't have to have a satellite in the right place, but the floods propagate the downstream. So it's not like you see a photograph or do it. You have to survey after the fact. But why go into it? My fellow commissioner, Mark Colley, has taken our published map, a recently published map that I think is in your packet. And um, Interface it with Google Maps so everybody can use it. And and 
more than that. He's he's got all the, the county data and property data and stuff on the same map. Uh, can I want to turn this over to Mark? I'm glad to address uh, questions or whatever, but uh, Mark uh, can show you this the capability he's got. It's uh, under development, and when we get these uh, property survey, he, he'll be uh, glad to add those to that database. So for any property, we can figure out. What's what's the best uh, thing to do? Buy out, flood proofing. What kind of flood proofing? Property by property, you will have the, the information you need to make informed decisions. So I, I want to sit down. I, I've gone a couple of minutes over here, for which I apologize. That uh, Mark's got something uh, very uh, uh, uniquely great to show you, and I'll be around uh, yeah, now and any time to uh, address questions. Thanks, Dr. Chris. Uh, I wanted to acknowledge Dr. Chris and Eric Stein once again because they put in a, a lot of sweat equity in acquiring that data for uh, uh, what what they didn't mention was those sensors are loggers in there, you know, on the bottom of the the stream bed. So in order to collect the data, they got to go back down and get in the river and and then scan those for the data that was collected real time <clears throat> so we're not talking about you know a a uh, really high performance web-based thing they have to do it with sweat sweat equity uh, so uh, dr chris talked about the google map and unfortunately through some miscommunications the link to that did not get embedded in the presentation. So we can go over that at, at maybe some future date. But what I can do is tell you about the map a little bit. <clears throat> what we were able to do with, uh, you can look at the inundation boundaries and kind of think of that as a lasso and uh, find out where that lasso went and, and drag in all of those properties that were collected by that lasso. So on that Google map, we have all of the uh, all of the parcels from St. Louis County uh, shape data uh, that, that we believe are involved with potential flooding. Now, we say potential flooding because uh, in there we also have the uh, properties that were condemned. And, and when you look at the, the condemnation uh, locations versus the map, you kind of scratch your head because uh, our map indicates that we have potentially 670 parcels that would be affected by flood. And actually the, the latest number, I've been working with Tim Scott from the city staff on how many have actually been uh, condemned in the last six months, and that was 250. Not all of those were due to the flood. Some had other issues and things like that. But roughly, you know, say 230 to 250 properties, we suspect have uh, been affected by the flood. For instance, you go on Dartmouth, there are no condemnations along. Dartmouth there. You go to the other side over where Vernon is, and you know, it's a stream of houses that have been so so one has to scratch their head on uh, you know, it, it's a potential social justice issue and all of that. So what we would like to have is those the first floor elevations of those 670 uh units uh interrogated and surveyed so that, that we can preemptively kind of know where to go. It's going to save the city time. And we're also working on some electronic means to uh, fill out FEMA forms electronically rather than you know filling them out by hand. So if an inspector has a, uh, you know, if an inspector has a uh, uh, tablet that is uh, uh, enabled for the web, 
you would be able to fill that, that form real time while you're standing there, have a complete form uploaded to the web, and we'd have the data and it would be logged for the future. So that's kind of getting at how, how we took what Dr. Chris had done, added some of the county data to it, and then, uh, you know, at really at that point, it's doing high school geometry. And, and uh, so we think we have a pretty good handle on what the potential flooding situation is and uh, what it really means to the city. So I'll, I'll shut up from here, unless there's any questions from anybody for any of us. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there any questions by uh, from the council uh, to Dr. Chris and um, Commissioner Holly? Any questions? Council Member Clay. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Smotherson. Um, and let me thank um, our stormwater task force, certainly Dr. Chris, uh, for for this presentation. Um, I, I think you you articulated this, but I, I just want to be clear about it. If you had to pick the most important thing that the city could do from the non-cost and Canada is always kind of cost associated with everything, but the non-cost uh, category and the cost category, what would be your number one thing in either category? Number one and most urgent is the connection of the uh, warnings that are routinely issued by our our uh, early warning system with code red that that needs done it uh, immediately okay the uh, other thing is that uh, public outreach getting more information and flash floods are not understood they just all the time catches by so much by surprise they do kill a lot of people they cause enormous property damages they're severe here in U City. This is the worst stream in the state. We are most impacted. Of all the creeks in the, the state, this is the worst. So our public needs more information. We need a lecture series. We need a web page. We've asked for many of these things for years. We've asked for uh, high watermark signs, uh, have a memorial plaque to uh, uh, flood victims, where they die. As people stroll through the park, let them see what the water levels were, what happened. People are unaware. You know, if scientists and people try to tell them, but we have too few opportunities to convey necessary information to people. That can be fixed immediately. Thank you. And can I continue, Mayor Pro Tem? Um, and certainly there, there are some things that the University City can do, and I'm, I'm sure my colleagues and and uh, and the administration will discuss those things. Um, I know Army Corps of Engineers, MSD, others have a role in this, um, particularly with the Army Corps of Engineers. We we have received sporadic updates from them, and I know my, my colleague, Councilman Cusick, is... <laughs> um, has been bird dogging this unlike any other, and I thank him for his efforts. Does anyone have a sense of what the Army Corps is doing? I've not heard from them in some time. I don't know where, where are they in there. Can you study the detention basin, which might help? Now, here I have a minority opinion on our commission. I think, for the most part, just giving more money to the guys that made. Excuse me, Dr. Chris, Dr. Chris, I'm sorry, Dr. Chris, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, could you speak into the mic because we are recording this and it's important to get all of what you're saying and so that everybody gets to hear and understand what yes, you're saying. Okay. Thank uh, you. Yeah, I apologize. Um, the Army Corps is, is investigating the detention basin that will help, I believe, with our uh, more frequent floods. I do not think, and here again, I have a minority opinion of the uh, commission, but uh, I do not think that that dependence and basin, had it been in place, would have saved us anything in the last flood, nor in 2008. It would help with 2019 and 2020 and some of our smaller events. 
I believe the most cost effective thing that can be done is flood proofing of homes that uh, can be identified and also uh, uh, continuing uh, buyouts. I mean, after all, you would have had dozens of additional homes underwater this last event had they not been bought out after 2008. You might have had more fatalities right along Wilson Avenue, but the city did the right thing and got those homes out of there. And that is the right thing. The commission can help you identify the most impacted homes, identify those and uh, prioritize uh, uh, flood proofing and buyouts and, and other things, but it's gotta be data driven. If you want models and a lot of expense, wait for the, gov the government, the federal government to help you and wait for them to come along with their, like Santa Claus with a bag of cash and throw it on your lap and expect uh, a major commitment of you city funds uh, as part of that in kind. I don't think that's the best approach. I think there's plenty of cost effective things to do. The recommendations I made should be implemented before this this coming flood season, this summer, they cost nothing. You said he needs to do what you said he can do first. That stuff can be done immediately. Even if we fund a detention basin, it might be a good idea, but your years in the future. So uh, that's my take on it, but it's a professional and a personal take. Not necessarily uh, am I speaking for the the uh, views of the commission. Right. Right. Pro Tem, uh, some others, and council member uh, Clay. I wanted to share with you kind of what is happening with uh, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers as it relates to the detention basin uh, project. If you recall, uh, you've been advancing the construction of a detention basin. Uh, to actually help with mitigating uh, flooding that occurs in University City, as well as in some of the communities that will be downstream of, of University City. Uh, they expect to have uh, the final approval uh, from the Army Corps of Engineers uh, hierarchy uh, sometime in April uh, or May is what they are estimating. Uh, at that point, it's really up to uh, us to work with our uh, Congresswoman uh, Bush to try and get the funding for that detention basin within an appropriations bill at the federal level. The total cost of that project uh, is estimated to be about $13 million, uh, and University City will be responsible uh, for roughly 35% uh, of those costs. I think we can all agree that stormwater management uh, is a regional issue uh, that we have. Uh, and I am not convinced at this point that uh, the agency that we believe has responsibility for stormwater management and the communities that are impacted align uh, with what we believe that agency, uh, regional agency, uh, should be doing. I certainly uh, applaud uh, the efforts, along with the mayor and council, uh, of the uh, Commission on Stormwater Issues uh, in their study of the events that occurred both on the 28th uh, and the 26th of July in 2022. Uh, but Part of the recommendations highlight uh, the need for more stringent um, maintenance of the river to pair, uh, and perhaps even a greater focus on the infrastructure uh, that is needed to better manage the stormwater runoff uh, that is occurring. We could have, uh, and I, what I have indicated to each of you is that I believe buyouts is a part of the solution. It is not the solution uh, because buyouts would not have affected all of the stormwater runoff that was coming down Olive Boulevard uh, on the 28th and again, uh, as well as on the 26th. So we're looking at it from a piecemeal perspective 
and it really needs to be evaluated based upon a regional perspective. How do we have infrastructure in place that address the stormwater runoff, not just in University City, but throughout our entire region? Certainly we have responsibility and you as a council for uh, stormwater runoff that occurs here, and then you are taking steps to try and help mitigate that. But again, that is not the solution. It is part of a solution, but it's not the solution. It's a much broader issue. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Um, are there any other questions? Council Member Cusick. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Smotherson. Dr. Chris, I would like to, um, as they say, poke the bear. Um, you, it was, we, uh, if you could step up to the microphone, because I want to talk about the Army Corps of Engineers. In your last page of your presentation, you talk about data driven flood management decisions. But I just would like, even though I know and you know, I'd like some elaboration for those listening on the difference between what the current Stormwater Commission for University City is doing with their information, which is data-driven, versus what we've been getting from the Army Corps of Engineers, which is just simply modeling. Um, would you just make some generalizations about that and how that is going to help us for in the future? And with the modelization uh, procedures that the Army Corps of Engineers uses, would that have helped us at all in the, in? well, it wouldn't have helped us with the flooding, but uh, d does it help us at all in being prepared for future floods? The only way to understand a, a natural phenomenon like this is to study the natural phenomenon itself. The Army Corps presents only models. They've never walked the river to pair. They've made no measurements. They run computer models. The FEMA uh, profiles I showed you, which is FEMA 2015, is identical to the HUD profiles of 1977, which I can demonstrate. There is no difference. And these updates of models, the models had no semblance to the red line I showed you on the graph that just happened. The models, the Army Corps recently assured us by their uh, modeling that, that the uh, flows measured by the USGS would have easily gone in through the tunnel. And the tunnel wouldn't have been overtopped. And we wouldn't have had the Metrolink flooded. And we wouldn't have had a fatality. And we wouldn't have had a firehouse flooded and all those homes downstream of the tunnel mouth. And we wouldn't have had five water at just a... a, a, a on the streets and in some of the homes just a quarter mile north of us. So real data is the way to solve a problem. And I can offer that. I have a lifetime of doing it. And that's my approach. I do not believe that modeling is the best way to do things. And isn't modeling what the Army Corps of Engineers bases most of their... Absolutely. Uh, they they on? made no measurements. I've made thousands of measurements. I've walked the river to pair. I've made hundreds of isotopic measurements. I had in-stream sensors uh, and water samplers in the early 2000s that were permanently collecting water data for isotopic and chemical analyses of the, the river to pair. I've looked at the thing for years. You got to get down there and look at it to see what the problems are. You know what? I pointed out years ago that the the Pennsylvania Avenue bridge is undersized and that there's a big sandbar right in front of it, which exacerbates the problem. I pointed out by survey that the Groby Bridge is undersized. Right now, there's a huge tree trunk stuck under your undersized bridge. How would you know? You think the Army's going to tell you? They're not down there. I am. And then while you're on the subject of being down in the river and looking under the bridges, one of the things that you stated earlier was that we needed we need a better management because we currently have very poorly managed channelization of the river to pair in our area. What actually can be done? And, and I do see that we're running short on time, but what what could be done to improve that situation? Well, debris clogging of the bridges is the uh, biggest problem. They are the undersized, most restricted parts of the, the river. And uh, 
But the biggest problem you have is accelerated runoff delivery with impervious surface and storm sewers, plus an undersized channel that impedes the flow. So it piles up. And maybe there's a problem with the tunnel mouth. I advocate immediately finding additional sensors to get one in there to at least start collecting data on what it's uh, uh, conveyance really is for different storms and water levels. That's going to be data driven. The model just told you there's no problem. So take what I'm telling you. I, I was I was there and looked, and there was a problem. And then finally, the there was some question that the the tunnel did not handle the uh, rain runoff as it should have at the end of July. Was there something wrong with the tunnel, or what do you want to? What kind of comments would you like to make? <laughs> it needs to be looked at. This this needs to be studied. Whether I can figure it out, I don't know. The tunnel could have been simply overcharged, but the heavy rainfall uh, terminated just uh, southeast of us. And so I don't know why the tunnel would. Uh, but the I don't know if it got clogged. I don't know. I do know that there was reports. Uh, 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 Commissioner Stein reported a big tree falling in the in the channel. Uh, the a couple of weeks before the storm, nobody did anything about it. There's big debris can clog her bridges, can clog the tunnel mouth. I don't know what happened. I don't but have the, a crystal ball, but I, I think we ought to start looking. The tunnel should, should the tunnel have been able to handle the flow? According to the modeling. According to the, the modeling. Only, but, the only way but, to but, figure it out is with measurements and see what it really does, not believe in a model. Real data or the final arbiter of, of, of reality. But th thank you for the question. Thank you, Dr. Chris, and thank you to the other members of the Stormwater Commission. And I'd like to add that the all of the commissioners on the Stormwater Commission, we owe our thanks to them because they have put in hours and hours and hours of blood, sweat, and tears, as well as plunging through those rivers and the data that's out there. And um, I'm just so impressed with the work that all of the members on this commission have done. Thank you. I wanted to thank you also, Dr. Chris and 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 Commissioner Holly and the Stormwater Commission uh, for the work that you've done. We're going to adjourn this meeting at and the correct time is 627. We're going to start the council meeting, uh, I would say, as soon as we can get back and uh, and prepare for that. So we're going to try to start as close to 630 as we can. Thank you. <laughs>